Um, so I am absolutely delighted to be here. I want to thank um, Paul Florsheim very much for organizing this. Um, as Magda was talking at the beginning and then as Paul was talking, I was feeling like this is kind of a dream come true for a researcher like me who cares a lot about fathers and really wants to see good things happen for dads um, and yet doesn't get the opportunity to interact with people like you that are trying to do things about that. And I'm excited to be here to talk a little bit about the research side and then to learn from you all throughout the day on the policy and practice side in terms of how would we implement this and what would it look like to try to get dads more involved um, with their kids. So it's really an honor to be here, and I'm just um, thrilled. So uh, this is working. now this is working. Okay. <laughs> okay, I think this is now working. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Do you want to okay, uh, I'll just set it there. Right. I already got one thing clipped on. Okay, if I talk like this, does that work, or should I hold it? Okay. Let me know if you can't hear. Um, okay, so I think um, most of you don't need this background, but I just want to set a little bit in context what's been happening with fathers. Um, there's been a lot of change in family life, right? Anyone that's looked at what's going on um, in the U.S. since the middle of the 20th century has realized a lot of things have changed about how families operate. Um, there was a big rise in divorce that's now declined a bit but remains high. Um, there's been a delay or decline in marriage, um, increase in cohabitation. And for purposes of my talk today, there's been, as Paul was showing, a big rise in non-marital childbearing. Um, so taken together, these trends mean that there's a lower likelihood that kids are going to spend their whole childhood living with both of their biological parents. Um, and why do we care about this? We care about this because we know that it's in general related to diminished resources, both time and money that kids get, especially from their dads, if they live away from their dad at some point. And this might then perpetuate inequality going forward. So thinking about what this means down the line for future generations um, is also important. So Paul showed you a piece of this overall. I just want to point out the trends by race ethnicity. Um, if you look at the blue line, it shows that about 6% of all births occurred outside of marriage in 1960. Um, that has now gone up to about 41% of all births. Um, and as Paul noted, there's been a real decline in teen childbearing. And a lot of the action is now happening in the 20s, um, sort of young 20s, mid 20s. So I'm going to be talking about unmarried fathers generally. Um, but keep in mind that these are mostly relatively young men. Um, there's a big difference by race ethnicity, right? So if you look at the white line, it's about 29% of white births today, um, going up to about 73% of African American births. So it's the majority experience for black and Hispanic men having kids that they're going to have those kids outside of marriage. So what are some of the important questions to think about in terms of unmarried fathers? Um, here are just a couple that I'm going to try to shed some light on uh, today. Uh, what are unmarried fathers' characteristics and capabilities? Um, what are parents' relationships at birth, and how do they change over time? Do parents stay together? Do they continue to interact? What does that look like? Um, and then finally, how are involved are unmarried fathers, and what factors promote their involvement over time? I'm going to focus on data from the Fragile Families and Child Wellbeing Study. Are any of you familiar with this study? One. OK, great. Um, then I'll tell the rest of you about it. So this is one of the first studies that's ever looked um, in a really large sort of nationally representative scale at unmarried parents and what goes on when parents have a, a birth outside of marriage in large US cities. Um, so it's a birth cohort study, meaning sort of births all at the same time, um, in the late 1990s. Um, there were nearly 5,000 births, and what they really wanted to do was get an oversample of unmarried births and try to get a sense of what's going on with these unmarried parents. Um, so at the time, it was about one out of three births occurred outside of marriage, and they actually did the opposite. They got three unmarried births to one married birth so that they could have some comparison to see how do unmarried com parents compare to married parents, but really have enough of them to look at some of the variability in unmarried parenthood. So it was in 20 large US cities of population 200,000 or more, including Milwaukee, um, 75 hospitals. So it was a hospital-based design to try to get fathers, particularly to participate right from the time that their child was born. And um, a lot of other studies have had a hard time getting dads um, to be part of studies, to be interviewed. Um, they may not be in the household. They may not be willing to, uh, to engage. And it seems that when you go to fathers right at the very beginning of the child's life, that's a, a really opportune time to get them to be not only involved in participating in the birth and being thinking of themselves 
themselves as a father, but also being willing to um, participate in a study. So for us, that was helpful to get the information. Um, and I should say that this is actually run out of Princeton and Columbia universities um, with someone named Sarah McClanahan and Irv Garfinkel. Um, that designed this work with a, a lot of other people involved, including Ron Mincy at Columbia University, who's done a lot of work on uh, young disadvantaged men. Um, so the interviews were conducted with moms and dads. Um, the fathers, about 75% of them were interviewed. So um, you, we might want to get all 100%, but getting at least three quarters of them, I think, was a good start. Um, and then these men and the mothers and the fathers and the kids were followed up then one, three, five, and nine years um, after the birth. So in, just to give you some sense of the term fragile families, um, this term was actually developed by Ron Mincy. Um, the idea was that these are families, right, because they have a biological tie to their child, and at least at the time of birth, some connection to each other. Um, and yet they're fragile because um, there's a lot of disadvantage, um, instability in relationships, and some other things that I'll show you um, in a few minutes. So where were the cities? Um, they did a stratified probability sample, which I won't go into the boring details of how that came about, but they ended up choosing um, this group of 20 cities, like I said, including Milwaukee. So a lot of cities in the Northeast, the Midwest, several in Texas, and several in California. Okay, so I want to start by describing some of the characteristics of unmarried fathers. Um, oops, sorry. Actually, yeah, I'll skip that one. Okay. So who are unmarried dads? Um, I'd mentioned that they are um, relatively young. And so here I'm showing you information about both moms and dads to get a sense of who are these parents that are bringing a new child into the world. Um, on average, the moms are about 24. The dads are about 27 years old. Um, they're predominantly black or Hispanic. So the dads, 44% are black, about 35% are Hispanic. Um, just under a fifth are white. Um, in terms of education, they're very um, moderate to low education. So more than a third have less than a high school degree, 39% of a high school degree, um, a fifth have some college, and only 4% have a bachelor's degree. So if I'd shown you the numbers for married parents, you would find a really stark contrast where for the married dads, um, a, I think it's a third or 40% have a, a bachelor's degree compared to these unmarried fathers. Um, also, the minority are likely to have lived with their own parents at age 15. So about 42% of the dads lived at their, during their adolescence with both of their parents, meaning that about 60% were already living away from their dad at age 15. So what about some of the other characteristics? I think that um, people had worried about um, sort of what are some of the social psychological characteristics of unmarried fathers. Um, it turns out that substance abuse seems to be relatively rare. So about 6% of dads reported that they had some sort of a substance problem. Um, violence is also um, not very um, prevalent. So as Paul was saying earlier, there might be a small minority of fathers who could be um, dangerous for their kids, but it's not the majority of men. Um, most of the men say that they want to be involved, they hope to be involved, um, and the mothers want the dads to be involved at the time of the birth. Um, depression is relatively rare as well. About 12% of dads are indicated for depression. Um, by contrast, having been in jail or prison is relatively, um, is not as rare, right? So over a third of dads around the time or within a year of having their unmarried child, um, they've been in jail or prison at some point earlier in, in their own lives. And I'll show you more about that in a few, in a few minutes. What about their attitudes? Um, it seems that um, some people have talked about gender distrust between men and women, and it seems that there is some of that. So women say, uh, or mothers say, that men cannot be trusted to be faithful. They agree or strongly disagree in almost a third of cases. It's a little bit lower for the fathers, but some people have talked about um, issues of sort of commitment and trust and how you can know that your partner is going to be there for you, and I think that does come up in some cases. Um, strikingly, the majority of, especially dads, uh, think that it would be better for the kids if they were actually married. Um, and the majority think that the chances they're going to marry the other parent, sorry they get cut off there, but pretty good or almost certain, 71% um, say it's, you know, we have a pretty good chance of getting married over time. Um, so I think at the time of the baby's birth, um, 
unmarried dads are relatively um, disadvantaged. If you look at their um, education and their sort of earnings potential, their earnings on average are about, I think, $17,000 a year. Um, but they have uh, high hopes for their own relationship uh, with the baby's mother, and they say that they want to be involved as a dad, and they're, they're excited to be um, connecting with their child. So what about parents' relationships at the time of the birth? How do the couples get along, and sort of what does that look like? I think before studies like this had been done, um, people had the idea that unmarried parenthood was really about casual sex, and maybe the moms didn't even know who the father of their baby was, that, you know, who knows how this is all playing out. And I think some of the um, research from this and other studies has shown that that's not really the case. Um, so this is just a figure showing you the proportion of um, people or parents in different relationship statuses with each other at the time of the baby's birth. Um, and fully half of them are living together. Another third are in a dating relationship where they're living apart. 8% um, say we're just friends, um, and 9% say that there's little or no contact. Um, so I think this surprised a lot of people that if you add those two big pieces of the pie, fully 80% are in a romantic relationship of some sort at the time that their baby is born. Yes, sorry. Maybe I'll hold it. Is that better? Yeah. Okay, thank you, that's helpful. Um, so what about by race ethnicity, right? So I showed you that the majority of these parents were African American or Hispanic, so I think it's important to think about what does this look like in different types of um, couples. And I think what's striking here is that if you look at the two darkest pieces of the pie, like if you just focus your eye on the purple and the the other purple, you see that they're about the same, right? So it's about 80 some percent of all couples are in a romantic relationship of some sort. It just differs a little bit what that relationship looks like. So for white non-Hispanic couples, about two thirds are cohabiting, um, whereas for uh, black non-Hispanics, about 37 percent are cohabiting. Um, but these other pieces, saying that we're friends or have little, little or no contact, that's not the, the typical experience at all. That's a very unusual situation to be having a baby with someone that you're not in a romantic relationship with of some sort. So I've shown you uh, the pie that kind of had this information, but just to orient you, I'm going to show you some uh, patterns over time about what changes. So obviously these are unmarried parents at birth. I told you that half are living together, the other third are dating, and those other two pieces of the pie combined to be broken up, about 18%. Um, so what happens over time? I told you that a lot of the parents say that they want to get married, they expect to get married. It turns out that, you may not be surprised, given the work that you do, that doesn't actually play out. Um, so by nine years after the birth of the child that we're looking at, um, less than 20% of these parents have gotten married. Um, about 13% are still cohabiting. Um, only 2% are living apart but still dating. Um, and the majority have broken up. So for about two-thirds of the couples, they're no longer together with that partner in a relationship um, by nine years later, so with a nine-year-old child. Um, does this surprise those of you who work in this field, or is this what you would have expected? Expected, yeah. I see some heads, <laughs> some heads nodding. Um, yeah, so there's a lot of relationship instability, um, and the parents don't tend to stay together even though they have a lot of um, high hopes and ambitions for such at the beginning. So Paul referred to co-parenting and the importance of co-parenting, and I think it's really important to realize that um, just because the couple's romantic relationship ends, um, it's not the end of their interaction, or we hope it's not the end of their interaction with their child. Um, I should have mentioned at the beginning Julia Goldberg, raise your hand, <laughs> sitting right here. Um, she's a doctoral student who works with me at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, and she helped with some of the analyses for this talk. Um, and we've done some work on co-parenting to try to figure out what's going on with these unmarried parents, and um, how does it matter for the kids, um, and what are some of the things that sort of facilitate co-parenting. And so uh, co-parenting <coughs> excuse me, is basically the ability of parents to work together in rearing their common child. Um, and it differs, as you might expect, between parents that are living together versus living apart. So you can certainly have a co-parenting relationship, and we hope that you have a co-parenting relationship when you're living together, that you're working together to raise your child in a positive, productive way. But this may be the only or the primary primary interaction that unmarried parents have once their own relationship has ended. So in this data set, we have some information about uh, six pieces of information, um, or six items that refer to co-parenting. Um, I'm just showing them here. So when he's with your child, does the 
Uh, the father acts like the father you want for your child. You can trust the father to take good care of your child. He respects the schedules and rules you make for your child. He supports you in the way you want to raise your child. You can talk with him about problems that come up, and you can count on him for help. Um, so we have this kind of measure that we average. And I just want to point out that, um, as you might expect, it's higher among co-resident parents. So they fall some, somewhere toward the always true end of the spectrum. But among parents that are living apart, I'm showing you here one, three, and five years after the baby's birth, it's relatively um, high, right? It's not zero. It's sort of on average just a little bit more than sometimes that they say this happens. Um, so I think that there's an opportunity here to think about um, keeping dads um, connected through kind of, as Paul was saying, co-parenting. And it's exciting, um, excited to learn more about the intervention that, that he's been a part of to do that. Um, so what about father's involvement over time? How does this play out um, after the baby's born? So I think here the goal is to get fathers involved um, early, right? And then to keep them involved in the kid's life because we believe that uh, fathering is, has a positive effect on children's well-being. So, um, so here I'm showing you um, taking the relationship measures and condensing those to just think about from the father's perspective who's living with versus living away from their child. Um, and as I said at the birth, about half are living together. Um, by nine years later, about 70% of the dads um, are non-resident. So in the earlier one, I think it was 67, were broken up and two, it's two point something percent are in, still in a romantic relationship. But the modal child will be living away from his biological dad um, really by three years after the baby's birth. So it starts out at a half, some of the dads <coughs> move in by one year and then tend to move out over time. So what are the, some of the things that might predict whether the father is co-resident at nine years? Uh, so Julia, Ransom and Alice is trying to understand that. And here's what we found. We found that older dads are more likely to stay together. Um, this is predicting being together at the nine-year um, nine follow-up. So this is really that last time point. So what predicts being in this 30% that still lives with their kid? Um, so white and Hispanic are more, dads are more likely to um, be living with their child than black uh, fathers. Um, being employed seems to have a positive impact, as you might expect. So when the dad um, can hold down a job and contribute to the household, that's an important factor. Um, if he's in better physical or mental health, he's more likely to stay together. Um, incarceration is a, is a big negative factor, as you might expect. So obviously incarceration um, is not a random event. It doesn't come out of nowhere. So whether that's the experience of having been incarcerated that changes men or whatever precipitated them to become incarcerated, those men are somewhat different in their, um, the prevalence of, or the degree to which they stay together with the child's mother. Um, physically violent. Um, this is a really small group, as I said, and somehow it's positively related to um, living together. I don't quite understand exactly what is going on with that, but it's a very small um, part of the sample. And then obviously, as we might expect, those who are in a cohabiting relationship or visiting or dating relationship are more likely to stay together um, over time. And then we also find, importantly, that um, couples relationship quality, so how much, regardless of whether they break up over time, how well they say they um, get along as a couple and communicate and understand one another at the time of the baby's birth, that's a big factor um, in whether they stay together. Um, and co-parenting is also a big factor. So relationship quality and co-parenting are pretty tightly correlated, as you might expect. Um, so if we switch it out and look at co-parenting, that's also a strong predictor of living together um, with your child or your baby, the baby and the mother over time. Um, I want to talk a little bit about something called uh, multi-partnered fertility, which is a bit of an awkward term, um, but basically um, researchers in this area have found that it's not uncommon um, for low-income men, or unmarried fathers in this case, to have children by more than one partner. Um, and so I think oftentimes in policymakers' minds, at least during the Bush era, the marriage initiatives, I think the idea was, you know, married parents look much better than unmarried parents, and if we could just get the unmarried parents to marry, um, that would solve a lot of problems. Um, I don't think it panned out that way, as I'm sure you all in this room might have expected, in part because these are really different groups of people, right? And one of the things that differentiates married 
married and unmarried fathers um, is their likelihood of having children by more than one partner. And that complicates um, them being involved with the focal child they have with a given mother. Um, and it makes the family dynamics more complicated, right? So if you just get parents married before or after they were going to have an unmarried birth, in most cases or many cases, you're not creating a nuclear family, I think as some policymakers had hoped or expected. So I'll show you some more information about that in a few minutes, but I think being mindful of some of these aspects of the family complexity um, and the instability are really important when we think about trying to reach out to unmarried dads. Okay, so I want to show you some more data about the level of involvement among unmarried fathers over time. Um, and just to give you some information about what the measures that we have in this study are, um, like most research studies, it's not a perfect um, set of, um, of items or information. We might want to know a lot more, but I think we know that um, spending time, engaging with kids, um, sharing responsibility for what the child needs, those are important aspects of fathering. So, th so there's, those are some of the things that we're able to measure. Um, so we can look at spending time, um, spending one or more hours in the past week on a measure from uh, one to five, ranging from never um, to every day. Uh, the frequency of engaging in activities, so how often do you read, uh, play with toys, uh, play outside, and so forth, ranging from zero to seven days in the past week. And then sharing responsibility, which is kind of a sometimes underappreciated aspect of father involvement, but helping uh, arrange um, the child going to the doctor or childcare, or sort of sorting out a lot of the things that um, kids need that's not just the direct engagement. Um, and then for non-resident dads, um, we look at the frequency of interaction. So how many days in the past month did they see their child? So the next couple slides will focus on these uh, measures. So here's involvement at one year by father's resident status. So if you look at um, whether you're, this is just a measure sort of over time, if the dad's living with the child or not living with the child. And what we see is that, um, as you might expect, um, resident dads are obviously a lot more involved, right? It's a lot easier to be involved with your child when you live there. Non-resident dads are much lower, um, but not zero, right? So if one year, if you're living apart from your child, you spend about the middle, um, the middle level of, how, of spending one or more hours a week. Uh, with your child. On engagement, on average, you're seeing your child about one day in the past week. And you're sort of sharing the middle level on responsibility, right? You're not doing it always, but you're not doing it never. You're sort of in between. So, sorry, thank you. Okay, how about that? Okay, <laughs> has to be very close. Um, okay, nine years. Thank you for the reminder. Uh, so then by nine years, how has this changed? And keep in mind that these dads are potentially moving out over time, right? So many more of them start out together and then they become non-resident by the nine-year survey. Um, and we see here that, again, the resident dads are pretty highly involved. Um, but it's also dropped in some cases for the resident dads. Um, and the non-resident dads, a lot of them have lowered their involvement, um, but there's still something there. There's still, on average, um, kids are seeing their father at least a little bit. And I'll show you in a minute, sort of, on average, what um, the range of involvement is. So what about so the resident dads? And again, these are all fathers who had a non-marital birth. Um, so these are the 30% who have stayed together um, through the nine-year survey. Um, and you see here that the, the involvement is quite stable, right, except for the engagement, which tends to drop off. And the measure changed a little bit at nine years, so I didn't want to compare them to the others here. Um, but you see that, in general, that it's relatively stable. So again, if you live with your child, it's relatively straightforward to be involved. And it seems that the resident dads stay involved. Um, so what are the things for resident fathers um, that predict whether they're involved more along these different domains? Um, it seems like there's a little bit of evidence that older dads spend more time with their child. Um, there's not a lot going on in terms of race-ethnic differences. Um, a small difference in terms of if you're using substances, you're less likely to spend time. Um, relationship quality is a positive factor, so if you and the mom work better together, you're more likely to be involved. Um, and again, this multi-partnered fertility, which I mentioned before, so even among the dads that live with the child, the focal child, um, if they have another child by a prior partner, they're less likely to spend time with the, the child with whom they live. Okay, so turning to the non-resident dads, um, this is then saying how much um, do the fathers see their child in the past month? 
Um, so focus first on the right hand side here. So of all non-resident fathers, at one year, it was about eight days in the past month that non-resident, unmarried at birth fathers who were then non-resident across these different waves, how often they saw their child. It goes down to about four days. Um, this is at nine years. Um, and then just looking at those who do have some contact, because obviously that includes some that don't have any interaction with their child. At one year, the ones who are seeing their child within the past, frequently within, or seeing more than once in the past month, the average is about 15 days. So it seems like there's some dads that are really involved, um, and there's some dads <coughs> that really aren't involved, and there's kind of a group that's in the middle. And that average for even the dads who are seeing their child in the past month goes down to about 10 days um, at nine years. But that's still a pretty high level of involvement for these dads that have some interaction. It tends to be um, pretty, uh, pretty uh, high amount of interaction, I would say. Okay, so what about involvement for the non-resident dads who are stably non-resident? So a minute ago I showed you the stability of the resident fathers. Um, the non-resident dads are a much lower level, right? So I kept the scale on the same magnitude. The other lines were much higher. Um, and it's up to you whether you see that as sort of notable decline or stability. It's certainly going down over time, um, but it's not going to zero. Um, it's getting close to zero in terms of the, of the engagement. Um, so it does seem that for non-resident dads, they, they tend to move away from their children as time marches on, but still have some connection. So this is an overall slide that then takes unmarried fathers and looks at, okay, how much contact do they have when we consider those who may not see their dad at all, to give kind of an overall descriptive picture. And then I'm showing you on the right, just for comparison's sake, the marital births, to give some sense of what does it look like for those whose parents start out in a married relationship. Um, and what you see for the unmarried parents, again, that's at 30% where they're living with, the children are living with their father, the father with the child. 29% saw in the past month, might have seen a lot in the past month. 14% um, saw in the past year, but not in the past month. 24% haven't seen in the past year. Um, and then 3% the father is even un either unknown or passed away over that uh, nine year period. So quite a bit of heterogeneity, right? So I would say that some dads are living with their kid, they're very involved, they're doing a lot. Um, some dads are seeing, you know, their child sometimes, and, you know, having monthly regular contact. Um, but some are seeing very irregularly, right? So if you get to the pink and above, that's not in the past month at the time that they asked the survey. Um, and by, by way of comparison, the married parents are quite different, right? So most of them are still living with their father um, about nine years after, as you might expect. Okay, so again, then we were interested in what are the factors that predict non-resident fathers' involvement or who stays involved of these men that we're really trying to keep connected to their kids? What can we learn about the characteristics of the men who do stay involved? Um, older dads are more likely to be involved. Um, Hispanic dads are somewhat less likely to be involved, but there's really no difference between black and white men. And again, these are non-resident fathers. So there is a difference in whether you live with your kids, but then once we look at those who are living away from their child, it doesn't seem that race plays a part there or is there, there's any descriptive difference. Um, mental health, there's a slight um, benefit for being engaged. Um, but again, I would point your eye to the ever-incarcerated line. It seems like that's a big negative factor in terms of um, keeping dads connected to their kids. So I think trying to think about what's going on with incarcerated fathers and how can we um, meet them where they're at, whatever that looks like, to try to help keep them involved uh, is important. As you might expect, those who are in closer relationships at the time of the birth are more likely, the dads are more likely to stay involved even when they're living apart. Um, relationship quality that they did have when it started out is important. And again, this notion of multi-partnered fertility or having kids by more than one partner uh, seems to be important. So in terms of the incarceration, I told you a number of slides back that at the time of the birth, about 36% of the dads had ever been incarcerated. Um, that goes up over time because men may be going in and out of jail or prison. So by nine years, about half of these kids, um, their dad had some history of incarceration. So I think it's really incumbent upon uh, programs trying to think about reaching this population to recognize that and think about what that means. I'm not sure, I don't have the answer, but recognizing that as an, as an issue or something that's going on for these families. 
Now here is the multi-partnered fertility um, stuff, which again is a very awkward uh, phrase, <laughs> suggestions welcome about how to rename it. Um, but here I'm showing you by marital status at birth, um, which of these couples have kids by only each other or one or the other has a child by another partner or both parents are in that situation. So just to walk you through the married parents by comparison, 35% um, of the married parents we observe are having their first birth, 45% um, are having a second or higher birth but they've only had kids together. And then the small green slice is about 7% the father has a child by another partner but not the mother. 7% the mother has a child by another partner but not the father. And the other 7% they both do. So for that 21% of married parents, they're in this situation of having you know, one or more of them already has a child by someone else. So it's not zero for the married parents by any means. But when we get to the unmarried parents, I think we see a, a much more striking picture. The fact is that 24% are having their first birth, 14% uh, having a second or higher birth with the same person when they don't have other children. But for the big other slice of the pie, uh, 60, I can't do the math quickly, about 60 some percent, um, it's the majority experience that the child that we're observing in the study being born to these parents already has a half sibling, either by their mother or their father. And in some cases, in 23%, it's both of them. So they have a child by the mothers uh, with another partner, and they have a half sibling that their father had with another partner. Um, so I think, again, similar to incarceration, recognizing um, that these families are complicated and that it's going to be um, encouraging fathers to be involved with one child. Um, we need to recognize that there are other children in the picture and other mothers that they've had children with in the past. And thinking about maybe how to bring that co-parenting um, to the fore and try to get them uh, to work together, I think is really uh, important, recognizing some of the complexity and instability. Okay, how am I doing on time? Okay, great. <laughs> Good, because I have a few more slides and I'm almost done. Um, okay, so um, just to highlight how this plays out over time, um, for married and unmarried parents, this having children by more than one partner, this, the pie charts I just showed you here, this is shortly after the baby's birth. Um, and these are, as I said, young parents, right? So many of them, once they break up, will go on to repartner. And because the women are young and the men partner with women who are young, that they're able to have more children. Um, so what we found in this study is that by looking on the right side here, by nine years after a baby's birth, almost 80% of these um, parents, either the mom or the dad of the child who's in our study, has a child by someone else. So it started out at about 63% and seems to go up over time. Um, so again, just highlighting the complexity of these uh, situations. And again, it's not zero for the married parents. It's not that this doesn't happen, um, but it does happen less frequently um, for, for certain. OK, so I think I've, I've already highlighted some of this, but I, I'm a little scared to even offer this because I am kind of a researcher who looks at what's going on with dads. But I think from my vantage point, we need to think about um, a couple of different things. Um, the first is that fathers have very low economic capacities. As I said ear earlier on in the talk, um, the majority of them have either a high school education or less. Um, so the, these are not guys who are going to be getting, for the most part, professional jobs that are going to readily sustain um, a family or that are going to provide high levels of child support. And other people in this room, like David Pate, <laughs> know a lot more about this um, than I do. But thinking about what does it mean that these dads, by and large, aren't going to have more than a high school education in the majority of cases. And recognizing the economic disadvantage um, is an is a important first step. And then highlighting the fact that their, their lives may be complex. There may, may have been incarceration in the past. Um, there might be this family complexity of going on to repartner and have kids with new partners. We don't want them to leave behind the child they have. Some researchers in this area talk about child swapping, that you have one child, you have a new partner and a new child, and it tends to be that the first child gets a little bit less of your attention and your money, and trying to recognize that that's an issue, and I think something that needs to be dealt with in this field uh, is important. Um, I think capitalizing on fathers 
positive intentions at birth and starting early. Um, Paul is all about that. And so I think that um, also comes out of this data when we look at what happens over time versus what parents say at the time of the baby's birth. A lot of them are very optimistic and excited. At the time they're having a baby, they come to the hospital, they want to talk um, with the researchers about what they're experiencing. They have a high value on being dads and wanting people to know that they're fathers. And I think um, they, they expect to stay together with their partner and so forth. So I think trying to get that enthusiasm early on is really um, an important uh, point. And so Sarah McClanahan, who's one of the PIs of this study, has talked about a magic moment of this is really kind of a, a wonderful window when dads are making this transition for many of them, or they're making it in this new situation with a new partner, and they're excited. And I think trying to capture that excitement to sort of lead into interventions and programs um, is important. And then I think trying to encourage co-parenting. Um, I think a lot of the, um, at least the, the, the policies and the kind of relationship skills program, building strong families, those kind of things that came out in the uh, 90s and early 2000s, really focused on the couple relationship, trying to say, let's get unmarried couples to stay together. And how can we promote their relationship quality, promote their stability, and ideally get them to marry? Um, the reality is that most of them aren't going to marry, and I don't know if you know the results of that intervention, but it showed absolutely no effect on average in the, this Building Strong Families program, no effect on marriage and on stability of couple relationships. So it seems like people might want that and hope for that, but I'm not sure it's realistic for a lot of these couples. So I think realizing that if they separate or divorce from each other, we don't want them to separate from their child. And I think addressing that head on and thinking about what does co-parenting look like is really um, the way to go for this demographic group. So I just want to thank funders of my uh, research through NICHD um, and many funders of the Fragile Families Study um, over time. And, uh, and that's all. I'm really delighted to be here. So thanks for your attention. <laughs> Do you want to take questions? Yeah, we have a few minutes for questions. So. Great. Would love questions or comments. Or how do you react to this? So in the back and then here. When they did this study, and I don't think you mentioned it, but did they look at a plan versus unplanned pregnancy? That's a very good question. So these interviews happened the first time in the hospital, and the, the study um, designers made the deliberate intention or yeah, idea to not ask people that, because this was a brand new baby they're just holding, and it felt a little awkward to say, did you want this kid or not? Um, so they did not ask that. They did ask kind of around it. They asked, um, did you consider getting an abortion? Um, and I can't remember. It's like 30 to 40 percent considered that. So, sorry, what's that? <laughs> I hear rumble. <laughs> they're, they're saying, what, I think the rumbling is, so that's not an awkward question? <laughs> uh, right, <laughs> right. Um, I think it was, you know, it came in sort of a fertility section maybe. Um, so it wasn't deliberately asking, did you want this child? But it is kind of saying, actually, did you pursue or consider getting an abortion? So I don't think it's a very good proxy. Um, and I think most of what we know about unmarried births is that um, the majority are unintended. But at the same time, I think there's some variability around that. Um, and a lot of people that maybe didn't intend to have the baby, once they know they're pregnant, are very excited and very welcoming. Um, so I think it's sometimes hard to know what the intention questions mean, but we don't have good information about it. And yeah. the other thing that I had thought about was if they look at where the, how the parents were raised, like if they were raised in a two-parent or a single family. Yeah, they asked one very simple question, which is, did you live with both of your biological parents at 15? And on one of my very early slides, it was okay. about 40% of these unmarried parents were in that situation. It's about 60 or 70 percent of the married parents, so it's not all of them. But for the majority of unmarried parents, they didn't have a two-parent home, at least by the time they got to adolescence. And so I think recognizing that role modeling and what they may or may not have seen is another important piece. So thanks for that question. So let me just, I mean, yeah, please so jump in. In my research, I, I did ask that question. Um, was the baby planned? And, uh, and, and you know, sort of what were your, were your surprised? You know, those sorts of questions. And, and the vast majority of these are pregnant teens and their and their partners. It was in the gray. They they weren't terribly surprised. Some of them were surprised. They didn't. It wasn't really planned, but they knew they weren't using birth control. So there's all there's actually a, some research um, on adolescent pregnancy and sort of 
or adolescent sexual behavior that there are a lot of kids who are, in, who are operating in that gray, gray zone uh, of sort of, but not really trying to get pregnant. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, absolutely, I totally agree. So, yes. So I have two questions. One, how much of an age difference did you see in the pregnant mothers and the actual fathers? And then the second question, were any of the fathers or mothers married to someone else in any Ah, good question. Um, on the second one, I don't think we know that. Um, that's not something they asked about. So if the father came to the hospital, um, it was assumed that they were not married to any of anybody else. Um, not just if the father came there, in the study in general. Pardon, pardon me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it is an important detail because we don't, we don't know. Um, and there is evidence that, you know, it happens. There's other data that sort of says in, in a small minority of cases, but not zero. Um, on the first point, how different was the age of the two parents? I think on average it's about two years difference. Um, so most of the other research that's looked at that finds that um, the age difference is, isn't as high as people might have thought, but it is a year, year and a half or two years on average difference between the parents. So most of the men on average and most of the women were in their 20-somethings. It's just whether they were 23 and 25 or 25 and 27 and so forth. So, and we do find, I'm trying to remember the specific things about the older parents. The older, the older they are, the more likely they are to be kind of cohabiting. And there's slightly more stability in the relationships, as you might expect, if they're more mature and kind of have more time behind them to know what they're getting in for. Yes. Other questions? Yes. Uh, excuse me. Excuse me. As you talk about the lack of uh, fathers involvement in their children, was it any of the discussion about barriers? Yeah, so, um, I think I'll answer that. Yeah, so they didn't, a lot of this was kind of a um, survey trying to ask around a whole bunch of questions. So it wasn't an open-ended thing of what, what do you think are the barriers, um, but we can get at that by looking at sort of why um, they say they weren't involved with the kid. There's some questions about that. Um, and there's, there's information sort of more generally from the field about sort of what is it that's keeping parents from staying together. Um, and it seems like for the dads, um, you know, there is some what researchers call gatekeeping, right, of the mothers. Um, on the other hand, there's some where the moms are really encouraging the dads to be involved. And so I think that concept has maybe been a little bit overblown because I think for most of the moms, they say they want the dads to be involved. They're excited to have him involved and the dads want to be involved. So I think it's partly things about um, resources, right? Sometimes the, um, the dad doesn't have a job, um, isn't earning enough, doesn't feel like he kind of deserves to be involved. Um, and then there's aspects of the, the relationship with the mom and trying to coordinate with her. Um, so this probably isn't the best study to get exactly at that, um, but there is, there is some other research out there um, that gets a little bit more at that and tries to get a sense of what's going on. Um, yeah. Yes. I, will, these, will your slides be available or will this be downloaded? Will the slides be available or downloaded? Sure. Yeah. For my point, yes, I, <laughs> yes. if they can make it. <laughs> make yeah. 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 Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Oh, sorry. Did you do a breakdown by ethnic group? Of which um, relationships did end in marriage? Um, yes, so she asked, did we do a breakdown by uh, race, or ethnic group or race, ethnicity, and which end in marriage? Um, it's more, I'm trying to remember the exact detail. Uh, it's more li likely that the white parents end up getting married. Um, the black parents have the least likelihood of getting married, but that's not surprising because they start out kind of least connected. They start out less likely to be living together. Um, so in general, Hispanics um, and whites, I believe, are pretty similar in terms of their marriage proportion, and African Americans are somewhat lower. Yeah. All right. I think we... The, the, thank you. <laughs>